Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And welcome to Epiphany. This podcast is for the day of Epiphany, Epiphany of Our Lord, which is always on January 6th. This year it's 2023. And our texts are from Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 6, Psalm 72, verses 1 through 7 and 10 through 14, Ephesians 3, 1 through 12, and Matthew 2, 1 through 12. If you are celebrating Epiphany on Friday this year, good for you. Some of you might be listening to this podcast hoping for help with a January 8th sermon if you're more interested in marking Epiphany and and maybe shuttling off Baptism of Our Lord to another time and place. But here we are. It's January 6th, which also, at least for our listeners in the United States, now means something uh, additional to just Epiphany. There's um, huh. people all of a sudden know that date, mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, April 4th and June 4th and things like that in terms of these mm-hmm. dates. I'm not so sure that necessarily matters here, but there's a lot of talk about kingship in these epiphany texts and authority and who wields power and where is power sometimes showing up in unlikely places or being subversive and and so on and so forth. Um, well, yeah, and, and the way in which the commentary points us out a little bit in terms of the really the contrast between the images we have of the three uh, the three wise men, astrologists from the East, you know, come to visit Jesus with their gifts and their, uh, well, at least for me, I put them on one side of my nativity set so they're not intermixed with the shepherds. But but you have this, this really kind of uh, nostalgic sort of uh, beautiful picture of homage to Jesus, which is all there and recognition of who Jesus is, which is an epiphany theme for sure. But at the same time, you have this subterranean theme of, of as Warren Carter puts it, the empire strikes back uh, mm-hmm. when power is threatened. Uh, what, how does power and, and authority and certain kinds of power and certain kinds of authority when it feels threatened, what does it do? Or what doesn't get its way, what does it do? Uh, when, when you don't like the outcome of something, what do you, what do you do? And so that, I think it's worth, I think that could be a, definitely a homiletical uh, theme, this for this year to think about that that presence in this text and uh, the way in which uh, the way in which Herod, yeah, Herod is threatened by uh, by a possible competition, competitive king, and uh, and the way in which he sorts out and sifts out how he's going to find out who that is and what he's going to do. Uh, to resolve that issue. So I think holding both of those is important in this passage. I agree. And uh, the difficulty is the Christian message is always subversive. And Herod in his arrogance, in his power, in his position, recognized that even before it was a message. And so for the folks on the bottom, for the um, Um, regular everyday folks to suddenly have hope, uh, to suddenly be looking in a new direction. Um, It's really uh, an attack on his, um, the security of his position. And uh, I, I, I lead with that because if you go behind the text to understand what uh, his history in archaeology has revealed to us about Herod, there's some parallels that make preaching this passage with any kind of historical accuracy um, just as disruptive today as the experience would have been for King Herod in the first century. Um, this, um, I don't know, maybe it's the mode I'm in right now, but this uh, reading these texts and preaching them um, with authority um, really takes a prayerful consideration that you are listening to the spirit and not leaning on um, um, trying to maintain your own level of uh, superiority. This text, these texts, this news 
might just disrupt some of the political and national and ethnic powers that we've become very comfortable with in our economic system. So I, I begin by saying we need to be prayerful as we enter into this year, because if we're going to see Jesus, um, we're going to see our need in the, in the 21st century for the disruption that was caused in the first. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought all that up, Joy, especially kind of the, the historical setting for Herod and the complexity of all of this, because it's easy to paint Herod as just this killing machine. By all accounts, he was an incredibly agile and clever politician who knew how to make friends and did a lot of actually really good things for the social and geographical infrastructure of the land. He was also a bit of a killing machine and a monster at the same time. I mean, he's just a very complicated. That. Yeah. And so it's interesting. He's not the only one who's frightened by the good news, but also all Jerusalem with him. Right. I don't think that means every single person in the city, but it might mean the chief priests and the scribes and, and groups like that, who you would think would th would go, wow, King of the Jews, Messiah, this is good news for us. And this isn't to say that they're all necessarily complicit or also somehow evil or hopelessly compromised, but they're going to have to take a side, right? If they're people who have found ways to coexist peacefully with Herod, get what they want, keep the religious culture and machinery moving as it should and in ways that are good, they're going to have to choose a side now if this new king comes along. So it's just the, the fear here is complicated, I think, in terms of what this news means to people yeah. and how they're going to have to respond. Well, and then that response, then that raises the ante, if you will, of what will that response be? Mm. And so this text, this text, this story invites in this season of Epiphany, as you know, as we move into this season, what is your response to the manifestation of Jesus, to the presence of Jesus, and and the revelation of who who Jesus is and what Jesus' kingdom is about? And so, you have the response of the wise men, which is homage and worship, and then also they, uh, as our commentary notes, it they they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And uh, and then, but then, what what will what will our response be to what is revealed? And as the as the commentary says at the end, that Epiphany commemorates a manifest, manifestation of the Messiah not only to Israel but to the world. And so, it what how will the world respond to? the manifestation of God in this particular way with a particular kind of vision for a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven that we will, that, that will get unpacked as we move through the season of epiphany. But I think that's also an important thing for the preacher to think about not only for, uh, for themselves, but also to invite the listeners in, in what, as we move through this season, what is your what will what will your response be to what is being manifested, uh, and and sit in those sit in those responses and where do they come from and why and where are there resistances as you noted joy where are there disruptions of our own theological embedded theological commitments uh, and where are there revelations of something something new where where your only response is homage. Yeah, we don't have a lot of texts in the Bible that, that help us with interfaith appreciation, right? They tend to be critical of other nations and their religious practices. But here's a peculiar text that has these foreigners, I can use that word here, people who certainly seem to be practicing a different religion and have different modes of knowledge or wisdom, who uh, don't get it perfect. You know, they need help. They need to consult the scriptures, but they get pretty close and there's, and, and God appears to them in a dream. God warns them and they, they subvert Herod. It's an interesting way of, of opening the door to some of those questions, right? About here are folks who have been drawn to this newborn King. The homage is interesting with how that reads in light of Isaiah and the Psalm and what difference between homage and tribute, but Maybe that's for a different day, but something of, just to kind of dwell with these people. And, and we're not quite sure who they are. We sometimes refer to them as priests. 
Mark Allen Powell has spent a lot of his work in Matthew trying to argue that when people saw Magi, they would have thought more like a court gesture, kind of like fools as opposed to royal people. And so the fact that they figure it out while the the wise folks of Jerusalem can, I mean, in any, whoever they are, we should be shocked that they're the ones who That's the have the insight and have the wherewithal. We still use that word, the wherewithal to show up, not just with gifts, but also with worship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and oh, go ahead. <clears throat> so I, I'm going to just follow up a little bit on what Matt was saying, both that they uh, got it, that they came and they traded the, um, the favor that they, they had found from Herod or found with Herod, they traded that to listen to the voice that said, this one in power, Herod, is not trustworthy. And, um, and if you listen to this voice, then you will not go back the way that you came. Uh, and, and I think that's worth noting too, um, in the sense that, Sometimes those who seek diligently, to use the word from the text, are not seeking um, to pay homage or to pay tribute or to bring worship, but they're seeking for their own good. And if they are the ones who help you along the way, are you willing to trade their help for the true help of the presence of God? Yeah. And I, <clears throat> one other theme, and then we should uh, probably go move on, but I also you could think along the lines of verse 12 and having been warned in a dream, which is, which is, uh, oh, here, God's intervening <laughs> in this moment, not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. And so I think that's another maybe epiphany theme that Matthew sets out is, mm -hmm. uh, is, is looking for God's intervention or looking like you were talking about joy. What voices are you listening to? But, but where is it that, that, uh, that those disruptions of God or interventions of God are paid attention to? Uh, and what are they, what are they manifesting about who God is or how God is entering into this moment to, to move, move us in a different direction or to change course. And so that would be another theme I would put out for our preachers this week. Indeed. Absolutely. So Isaiah 60, got a great, a great Zion text here. I, I lingered on the light that comes in the darkness and um, just reading behind uh, the um, a traveling of those who are following a star uh, and whose uh, new instruction comes in a dream. Um, both of those are night uh, adventures. You know, we sleep in, at night. We, um, the stars are out at night. And, and the light, the clarity, um, the ability to see completely um, comes into that darkness. And um, that, that, that might be a homiletical theme to play with. Uh, both in terms of what we've talked about in terms of just the Matthew text of um, who is um, who is recognizing this light, who is uh, diligently seeking, who is seeking for their own gain, and then the light is shined upon them and you see what their, their real hearts are, what their real desires are. Uh, so I, I would offer that as a theme. Um, leaning out of the Isaiah text. Yeah, I think I I was really drawn to a line in the commentary of that each year when we hear these texts proclaim, and she mentions through Handel's uh, Messiah, we are reminded that no matter how dark, how desolate our personal and collective lives have become, once more light has broken into the dark and we are encouraged to arise and shine. Amen. Which, yeah, which is, which again is, uh, it's so, there's a, those juxtaposition of themes that you were talking about, Joy, are there in that, that, that light pierces through the darkness and we can see, but then also what is exposed about us, about others, and that when we arise and shine, sometimes that arising and shining is not 
is not only to be the light, which is what Matthew will encourage and say to the disciples, you are the light of the world, but it's also arising and shining to point out what the light has exposed, what the light has revealed. And are we willing to arise and shine in the light of Christ, in the light of God, and and say, but this is also what's been manifested uh, because of the light. So that's a so the arise and shine is 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 kind of a <laughs> a challenging call. Yeah, I, I think like how of you a, warmed a little John into that. <laughs> oh, she did, did a little she? Johannine symbolism found its way into that. <laughs> She's yeah. rubbing off on me too. I, you know, I could. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the arise and shine makes me think of a song from when I when I was a child. Uh, rise, shine, give God the glory, glory, <laughs> shine. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and and that 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 fits in. Yeah. Sorry, I'm still singing. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Now we all have an earworm. <laughs> Children of the Lord. You're welcome for, for that earworm. Matt, Matt looks looks like where 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 have you two come from? <laughs> I, I think there's a verse in there about Noah building an arky arky. Yes, arky, 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 arky. yes. 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 <laughs> Make it out of trees and barky barky or something like that. Anyway, we had a, we had a point. We had, I forgot what it was. We had a point. <laughs> I forgot what it was too. Oh, it was it was um, the recognition of the other side that Caroline brought up, not just mm -hmm. exposing the darkness, but our task uh, uh, that Matthew will say is to be the light. Yeah. Yeah. Apologies for everybody who's got that earworm in their head now I all day long. In a class all day, all week. <laughs> you probably have it for it'll it'll be one of the hymns of the day. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little bit They're going to talk to the Sunday school teachers about what song to teach the children this epiphany. Yeah, but I think another thing that that I would point out what we're what we are also doing, which we do every year, particularly moving into a new church season and now moving into a new gospel, is that so much of your homiletical sensibility is is gearing people or moving people to this this theological world of Matthew and and this particular liturgical season. And and I've talked about this with, uh, we've talked about this with our students, Joy, that one of the preacher's roles is to be the, the tender or the keeper of the liturgical season. And how is it that you are helping people move through a different kind of chronology than, uh, than, than what the rest of the world moves through. And so how how do we live fully into epiphany and and how is it that all of your sermons are tending to to that to that season and what what it means to be a, a Christian in this place and time. And, just and pointing, well, and how does that go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Matt. I was just going to say and how does that get imprinted then on the on our own identities? Mm -hmm. uh, as believers here, which, you know, we've all been trained historically. Um, these texts don't easily come to people's understandings of like, oh, that part of Isaiah, we're talking here about, you know, a Zion song, and we're talking about the rebuilding of the nation or Psalm 72 and its connection to David. I mean, so how we, this is, I think, difficult to do in the span of a single sermon, but over time, how do we say Look, these texts, I think all four texts today are talking about how are the wonders of God made available and known to Gentiles. And of course, in Matthew and in Ephesians, you've got that around Jesus. In Isaiah 60 and Psalm 72, you have that, these kind of dreams of what will Israel's strength look like for the sake of the world, whether that's through a great king, Psalm 72, or the rebuilding of Isaiah. And it's easy to criticize both the Isaiah and the Psalm text as being about power, as this light being something that draws the nations in terms of wealth. Uh, they give tribute. I mean, are these conquered people? What is it that draws people to the light? So to play around with that in the history of the nation, but then for the preacher to always come back to, so what does that mean for us? And the Psalms, I think, are especially helpful for this mm -hmm. over the next 
what is it, five weeks, we have six weeks of epiphany. How do the Psalms help us think about what we, the community, this community of faith, what do we manifest to the world mm -hmm. that interprets who God is for the rest of the world? You know what I mean? So the light that these, and Beth Tanner talks about this with the Psalm, right? That the light isn't just power and strength. It's about justice and, and concern mm -hmm. um, uh, for the needy and the poor. And yeah, what, is, what do you want to be known for is I guess the shorter way. Um, what do you want to manifest? What is this light going to be? Is it truth, right? Is it we're right, you're wrong? Is it a kind of means of climbing a social ladder in different churches? Is it respectability? Mm -hmm. and just kind of a morality. What is it that this community wants to manifest? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was my long you, sermon. No, that's wonderful. And I think you said this maybe at the beginning already, Matt, that um, one of us said it is, is that this is going beyond Israel to the Gentiles. This is going to all the nations. Um, Caroline, I know you said that at one point already today. And um, that when we get away from judging, which points the finger at somebody else and says, you're not quite up to the mark yet, but you begin to open your hands with generosity that says, come, participate, see, then that's how the message is expanded beyond our community into all the world. And when we read the text and, I, and I'm, I'm I'm looking at the end of the commentary uh, in, 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 uh, for Isaiah, where she says, um, perhaps Isaiah 19's equally revolutionary message that imagine trade as going back and forth between epicenters, in addition to the notion of a God who values each of the nations on their own terms, might help one to think, not just in binary categories of center versus margins, but rather corresponding better to the complex web, web of interconnections that our global village can become. That's hope in the midst of a divided world that if we arise and shine, to put that earworm back in our, in our head, that there will be an interconnectedness and not a division of us and them. Uh, is it okay if we jump to Ephesians? We kind of blurred a little bit of Psalm and and, and Isaiah sixty together, but yep. um, yeah, you want to talk about about Gentiles? Uh, Ephesians yep. three isn't a bad way to kind of summarize what, at least what the Pauline tradition has seen to be most incredible, perhaps about about Jesus is this 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 unification, right? This idea of Gentiles become fellow heirs, members of the same body and shares in the promise of Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the historical Paul would also say, apart from the law, <laughs> right? It would, you know, surely through the act of God, surely through God's own grace. Mm -hmm. We always think of that as like the message to start preaching so soon after Christmas, but that's what Epiphany is about, right? It's about mm -hmm. the manifestation of the Christ to the whole world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. For this that... reason... Mm -hmm. I'm just quoting the line for this reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you look at how often that the term Gentiles is used in this short passage in these just these 12 verses. And so now that we're coming to the end of the commentary and we've mentioned this theme, uh, just to for the preacher to go back and kind of re- Relook at these texts, review these texts through that lens of what, if we think about what possible themes we can lift up in, in the season of Epiphany, it is that manifestation of God's grace and God's love to the whole world. And it's worthwhile sometimes to remind our listeners that we're the, gen we're the world, we're the Gentiles. The nation. Yeah. Pardon me? Oh, sorry, just the nations so that people yeah. know what Gentiles means. Yeah, yeah, we're the nations, and so this is this is this is God's act toward uh, the entirety of the world, and and what and that. Oh, that kind of. I mean, it in some ways it should bring us back to Christmas, 
and and that's I think maybe an important homiletical homiletical connection as well that we that we bring people back to the the incarnation is that the word became flesh is for because God so loved the cosmos the world mm -hmm. and and so what what we're seeing in these texts is a recognition of of that the the expansion and grace upon grace. Yeah, I'm, I'm using John again, even though John, <laughs> you know, even though John's not even a text for this Christmas, but it's just always just, there, isn't it? It's just always, always there. Always, it's just, lurking. Yeah, it's it's John, always yeah. lurking in my head. <laughs> but uh, but also that it again it helps people imagine. Well, what does Christmas really mean? Uh, what did and and the Christmas is not just a day. Christmas is not just a season. But how is we live as as th as the truth of Christmas, and that's really what Epiphany is about. And so, helping people make those that connection back to uh, back to the birth of Jesus and the implications of that for the entire world is what these texts are working out. <laughs>